Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. I'm happy to have with us um, Doug and Nick. And we've had Doug on here recently talking about uh, Calvinism and narcissism. We can go ahead and turn the cameras on. See if they fit. Yeah, we're um, talking about Calvinism and narcissism. We've had Doug on here before and uh, everyone should know Nick. You know, every time he comes on here, I get a lot of complaints. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, um, yeah, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. I'm really glad to have both of you on. For those who are new, um, I'll just say that this channel is a Christian channel designed to help people uh, see the Word of God afresh as best as possible and expose people to as many different perspectives as possible. And one of the things that we see that is an, an impedance uh, like the Logos is trying to flow through people, and it seems that paradigms like Calvinism constitute an impedance that, like, uh, kink up the hose, if you will, um, that's, that prevent Christ from flowing through people as, as authentically and truly as he possibly could. So we see that as a big threat to Christian growth here. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, just a couple of seconds um nick and then doug just maybe about 30 seconds about what your background and interests are for those who are new and have not seen you before so i my background and interests i'm from connecticut um i have always been interested in sort of thoughts and human behavior uh i went to school for philosophy and psychology philosophy being way, way, way more interesting to me. Uh, I ended up being led through philosophical thought uh, to the Bible. And ultimately, um, in 2017, uh, accepting Christ as my Savior, and for the past years have been learning more and more about what that truly means. Uh, beyond the mere and empty profession of said thing. Um, so it's become a very deep and uh, meaningful part of every fiber and movement of my body and my experience through life. Um, I work in a, uh, a automotive and truck um, service company. So I repair, tow, uh, deal with uh, a lot of accidents and big catastrophic collisions and repair big, large vehicles. So that's what I do. And um, my Christianity is very much a huge, huge part of that part of my life as well. So I appreciate that, uh, Doug. Yeah, I'm the older guy in the room here. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're the adult supervision for me and Nick. Right. <laughs> so my background is is primarily in in psychology as a psychotherapist, mentor, coach. I'm a license I'm licensed in two states and um, mostly practice practice mentoring and coaching now. But I've been in organizational leadership in the healthcare industry. I've had the privilege of doing different kinds of things. I've taught at the university level. I'm I've always had a small practice, uh, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. I uh, really enjoy um, helping people uh, really grow and transform. And if I have an opportunity to bring that into a Christ-centered place, I don't always do. But if I do, it's just joyous for me. Um, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I believe he died for our sins. And uh, when I was presented with the gospel, I had an opportunity to accept it, and and I did, which wasn't a work. It was the faith <laughs> that he gives me. Um, so um, most of my current experiences, uh, most of my practice is coaching men. I do see some couples, but I love coaching men to a transformed and bigger place in their lives. I have a coaching program um, and a doctoral program in Christian apologetics. And the, the last two years, a little different than you, Nick. I've sort of stepped into philosophy. I never took one philosophy course in college, undergraduate mm -hmm. school, at University of Oregon. 
Um, I don't know why, uh, because I really enjoy it. So the last few years I've been introduced to metaphysics and epistemology and all kinds of things that are all these big words. And um, I think my current interest is probably primarily around understanding uh, free will, uh, determinism, and the different systematics that come into existence from those perspectives. And of course, Calvinism is, is one of them um, that I've been focusing on lately. I'm gonna do my dissertation around free choice and determinism and God's sovereignty. So it's been kind of fascinating to, and really helpful actually to uh, your, your, your presence in my life, Kevin, has just been really, really helpful and sort of mm. eye-opening. Um, I think in the last podcast, I told everyone that I was mentored by Jack MacArthur. So I know John and the family, Mm -hmm. uh, it was that kind of a, everything John MacArthur said was gospel to me. If you didn't agree mm -hmm. with him and you're probably wrong. And, um, right. <laughs> but, you know, that, that isn't true anymore. I think I've, I've really kind of understood his leaning into Calvinism is probably through his friendship with R.C. Sproul and that kind of stuff. And, uh, I, I don't, uh, agree with this systematic. Um, I don't agree with some of the things that have happened in that church either, mm -hmm. uh, but I am interested in narcissism and, how it penetrates the church, not only theologically, but in leadership structures and where it surfaces. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, uh, pastors have always been my friends in my life. And you'll see in churches oftentimes groups that coalesce around trying to obtain power and criticism mm -hmm. of the pastor and all those things. So it works both ways. Um, but anyway, my interest right now is just really zeroing in on what it means to be able to make a free choice. Does God determine everything I do? And really countering uh, the, the, the kind of Gnostic uh, philosophy that undergirds Calvinism. So I'm very interested in that theoretically and psychologically and philosophically. Okay. So um, last time we talked on this channel, you went into some details about how Calvinism, like Calvinism basically presents a narcissistic God. And if you, uh, it's difficult to not become what you're following. I got an email from somebody and I know the two of you have seen it. So what I wanted to do in this video is just kind of go through this email and take, um, what you might call a theological, philosophical, and, and psychological glance at what we're looking at here with this description that we have from this viewer. So, um, you know, Nick with a philosophy background, I have a theology background, and Doug has a psychology background. We can, uh, we're like the Holy Trinity of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the father. There you <laughs> One go. of you just died. One of you is the energy of the spirit. <laughs> me and, me right. and Nick will fight over that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what I'd like to do is I'm going to share my screen and read through this. Um, and I guess we can read through this all the way. And then we'll go back to the beginning and have uh, uh, whatever comments, whatever pops into your head that you think is worth noting as we go from any perspective. Let me move this thing out of the way. All right, this viewer, it's a female because she talks about her husband later. So she says, I've been watching all your YouTube videos these last three weeks and I'm so thankful for your voice of reason. Long story, my mom and I are the secretaries at our church. My family and my parents all go to this church. We have been here for 14 years, just as long as this pastor. When he first started, he didn't preach much because he had a lot of health issues. So we had different pastors coming in. That was great. Then this pastor got better and slowly started to sneak in election every once in a while. Then he said he wanted to start an elder board. Also told me in the office that if he didn't get an elder board, he would leave. My dad had been fa a faithful Christian man his whole life. He was a strong businessman and was on the board for the church. But my dad questioned the pastor on Calvinism. And he poo-pooed my dad, didn't give him any answers if he was trying to turn the church Calvinistic. And my dad told him that he was not a Calvinist and that this Calvinist stuff shouldn't be brought into a church. Don't cause division. Slide two of five. My dad met with, <clears throat> with him a couple of times, and this was met with deaf ears. I'm going to fix that spelling there. 
It's probably still wrong. So my dad brought it before the board, and that's when we saw a whole new side of our pastor. Now, under, that's my underlining, not theirs. Just my family and the board saw this man blow up. He went so low as to say my dad wasn't a believer. He tore up my dad's papers in front of the board and walked out saying, this is only one man's opinion. Bring it to the congregation and vote. They'll, they will keep me. The board decided to give the pastor a sabbatical and do some counseling. The pastor at first said no. Then he said, only if I can pick who I want. Uh, this all happened five years ago. He did apologize to my dad, but mainly for being caught in his anger. My dad was ailing at the time and he forgave him, but told him it would take him time to trust him again. Well, my dad died two weeks after he forgave him. <clears throat> now to the present. This pastor has now ramped up his Calvinistic preaching. He got his stacked elder board with the men whom he handpicked. These men are all in the same thinking and cannot say no to the elder. We had a meeting and this pastor started to show his anger again and a member during the meeting and at, a, and at a member during the meeting, he stood up and took a step towards this man and said, if you don't trust your elders, change your heart or vote them out. This caught this member off guard and hurt him deeply. He ended up leaving the meeting because he thought he had a heart issue. I can guarantee this man is the most sincere, caring, godly man besides my dad. I view him as someone I would go to with spiritual issues, not the other elders. But after that meeting, not one of the elders or pastor reached out to him. Seven families did, but not the pastor who did the hurting. They finally reached out two and a half weeks later and requested a meeting. So my husband went with as a middleman just to be there for them against the three elders. There was absolutely no apology by the elders or pastors. They started over and over again. They were right, and this other guy was wrong. I confronted my pastor at work and told him I didn't agree how he handled this and that it reminded me of the issue with my dad. He said I was wrong. I also told him I am like my dad and I don't agree with Calvinism. And he also told me that I am wrong and that he questioned my faith. Wouldn't you know, the next two Sundays from the pulpit, I got a lecture on election, predestination, and chosen, even though they weren't in the message schedule. He changed it just to make me feel uncomfortable, and now he won't even look at me, acknowledge me, or even talk to me at work. Do I just leave this church? My family is so involved with running the kids' programs to secretary work to decorating to serving fellowship this is just as much my church as it is his. How do I stand up for me and my God? And then any help would be great. Thank you for the YouTube videos. I wish my dad could have seen these. He would have loved them. So back to page one. They are secretaries. Mom and I are the secretaries at the church. The family and the parents all go to the church. When it first started, he didn't preach any because he had health issues, but then he got better and started preaching election every once in a while. And then his her dad approaches him. I don't know if y'all have a, any any thoughts or analysis on what's going on so far there. Good for his, her dad for knowing his Bible and just for starters, I mean, yeah, uh, that's pretty awesome that he was fighting for the gospel. Uh, but yeah, if I could just comment in general, um, this is this is uh, uh, how toxic leadership happens. I mean, it's a, a vignette there that really mm -hmm. demonstrates how th these kind of uh, men. Or really narcissist and sociopath. They don't care about anybody. There's there's no heart in yeah. that. Um, and how they work their way into leadership. When he demanded that there be a board, you know, he had an obvious intention behind mm -hmm. that. Uh, so, uh, and uh, w whatever those dynamics were in his pastor's life, he was able to to garner and gather other men. Um, because they're out there, <laughs> right, right? Waiting for waiting for power, waiting to to come alongside. So that's interesting. Yeah, leader. it's interesting. Like, um, it's almost it's almost like the ideology 
you buy into this ideology, I have a place of power for you up here. I have a, I can elevate you hierarchically within our in group if you become loyal to this set of beliefs and to me. Yeah. And yeah. and people tend to fall for that. Yeah, it's it's and somewhat rightly so. I mean, you're a congregational member. You think your pastor's, mm -hmm. you know, knowledgeable and. I've been in these positions my whole career in, mm -hmm. in, in a therapy office. You know, mm -hmm. it's granted to me almost. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in significant p positions of, of more executive leadership, there's there too, mm -hmm. you know, so you can find yourself in those, but this, this man, not unlike other situations I've heard about, this isn't that unusual, inserts himself in. And, and it seemed like initially, that the the board had him go to some therapy there was some sense in which there was a more there was a different leadership group it sounded like uh, i would wonder yeah, what like, happened to them where'd they go <laughs> you know yeah it's interesting so there's a couple of different things going on here when you go to i'll go to slide two i know you all have it in front of you where um he says something about getting an elders only if I can pick who I want. He wanted to have a board of elders. So there's, there's like this nine marks philosophy of Calvinist churches. And it has a set of instructions for how Calvinist pastors should take over. So there's not only the preaching aspect of let's indoctrinate these people with Calvinism, but there's also a restructuring aspect. So a typical Baptist church is going to have a pastor and some deacons. But there's what tends to come along with Calvinism is this uh, this board of elders kind of mentality, you know. And so you'll notice that when they are asking for stuff like that and trying to make those moves, it's like they are trying to shift they're trying to intentionally make that change. They're coming in with stealth, Cal stealth Calvinism and they're changing the beliefs. They're changing the administrative structure, the polity of the church. They're making all these changes. So that's, that's this goal that he has in mind, which I'm pretty sure that when he came to be the pastor of the church, he did not lay all that out for them, even though Probably not. he had it up his sleeve. Mm. Yeah. Can I try? Can I try and make a move here? That's probably gonna, Kevin's probably going to get flack for later. Um, <laughs> I hope but, so. Um, I, I tend flack. to. I'd like to. I'd like to try and take the email that we're talking about and sort of zoom out a little bit to gain mm -hmm. maybe a different, a little bit of a different perspective or angle on how we're like what's salient to us right now is Calvinism and Christianity and, and we're zeroing in on that. So I'd like to back up and sort of break that frame and think about, think about this situation in a different way and specifically in a mythological way. Um, and the reason I want to do that is because I'd like to sort of use a mythological look at this to maybe appeal to the audience's um, more intuitive human intuitions and mm -hmm. not so much to their quote churchianity intuitions um that are going to be rife with different um moral manipulations and things like that right so right. so thinking about <clears throat> when i think about narcissism i'm not a psychologist or or a professional by any stretch of the imagination. But when I think of uh, narcissism, I tend to think about it in a more mythological sense. Um, and so I know that mythologically, Narcissus is um, a character who, who is so beautiful that all he sees is his own reflection in the mirror in a mirror. Mm -hmm. I think it's, mm -hmm. I think it's in water. I, I don't, I don't really remember I, the mythology or the contents of it doesn't really matter. It's the patterns that are important. Um, mm -hmm. So what a narcissist is mythologically speaking is someone who can only see layers of their own image. 
over mm. and over and over and over again. So when they look at reality, their behavioral patterns will be such that they are projecting their own image onto an object mm. and their, their own self image is reflected back onto them. So if they're, if the projection is one of pure beauty and uh, in then what will be projected out is beauty and then reflected back beauty. So then it causes this reciprocal layering of, with all of these objects that's giving an output of a particular thing. And whatever the output is will be what what's inputting back in. So if I want to if I want to have a like a positive input into my own self, then I'll project a positive image or a subjectively positive image out onto the object in front of me. And it turns out that um, that gets very complex when you're dealing with when you're dealing with objects, which are their own autonomous beings. Um, and so when Doug, I think, was speaking in the last video, he was saying, when you're in a room with a narcissist, you're not actually there. And that mm, in, in right. mytholo and mythologically speaking, that's also true because the narcissist is not seeing you as your own autonomous being. All they're seeing you as is an object, which is an opportunity for them to use as a mirror to mirror their yeah, own the only, image the, back onto right. them. The only, just to add that, the only reason you might exist in the room is if you uh, properly mirror back their greatness and right. you're absolutely wow. right. So let's, 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 let's hold that mythological view of narcissism. And then when I read that email, um, the mythological patterns, some mythological patterns stood out to me. And I'd like mm. to try and hold both of those, those up for the audience and make the attempt to appeal mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. their mythological intuitions rather than their church or uh, churchianity sort of intuitions. And so some of the patterns, which I think that I saw in the email was as if there's an individual who is in a kingdom or in a realm where there is some kind of, you know, bad brother or, or usur usurper of the authority and the figurehead of her own father. And mm -hmm. that while her father is present in the kingdom, the this this person is kind of subdued. They're they're not able to. So see. Mufasa can keep yeah. Scar at bay while he's alive, while he's alive, while he's exactly. And so but then and so he's able to confront this this person and keep them in, in, in where they need to be. Then there's the death of the father. And this is where the whole arc arc of the story sort of takes off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the uh, the said evil person it comes into power, uh, assembles all of their, you know, the hyenas and the, the elders and all, uh, all yeah. of those people. Oh, and yeah. you're you're left sort of. With the question of, well, what, what do I do? And so um, that's as far as we've gotten in, in the analysis of this email, but I just want people to try if they can to sort of hold um, that mythological um, sense and yeah, yeah. those patterns while we're going through this, because it might help break the moralism that comes along with a, a more Chris, I, I don't mean to say it this way. I just don't have any better way to say it. Um, the more Christian view of this. I don't want us to get caught up in like, you know, doing a Christian response video to right, right. Calvinism or something like that, because that's just going to perpetuate um, a rivalrous, uh, a more rivalrous uh, um, situation. And, it, and that's going to cut off uh real real meaningful conversation between well 
between that's us. the big problem the big problem with christianity is that it it brings with it a system of morals which that in itself isn't a problem but that system of morals gets exapted by opportunists who then exploit people's loyalties to those morals as a way to frame what they are trying to do like if you value humility this is the humble thing to do if right. you value uh not being prideful then what i will frame what you are doing is prideful so right. what whatever it is that you value and don't value moralistically the opportunist is going to frame things in terms of those moral values to replace your your discernment your judgment your sense making and those things yes. with the appeal to values so so that thing that you just explained also has a prophylactic um mm -hmm. um like utility to it so that like in the space that the three of us have created right now mm -hmm. um all three of us taking a a perspective a a fundamentally different perspective that doesn't have the same moral foundations with it will be will point out mm -hmm. somebody who comes into the comments section or even came into this conversation and was like oh well, 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 well we can't do that well we need to we need to up bolster and uphold the sovereignty of god and then they start using the buzz buzzwords and you start to see that the person who has an issue with simply and merely listening and understanding a different perspective is the person who is going to be that opportunist that you're talking about, which is go yeah. because they're losing the control and the power that comes along with the moralistic uh, hijacking and speech. And Doug has yes. pointed this out um, when a narcissist is in a room that if there's a loss of control, like I think one of the best things that Doug said was that if a if a narcissist is in a, is in a room with me, I'm there. There's nothing they can do to me aside from like physically something physical. Right. Yeah, if they it's don't because, attack you, because he understands that the 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 the, the power cycle kind of in some ways needs to be corralled um maybe broken maybe um maybe kind of like jujitsu or something uh and and used by a wise person uh like, in like order judo, to using their body weight against them yeah yeah um yeah it may, might need to be you know like moved in a certain way in order to serve uh serve the good um or or serve the betterment and the 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 quality of the conversation at hand um so like i said i just want to make sure that people are understanding that what kevin just explained is also a metric you can use in order to identify just where somebody might be at in in their intentions when you're conversing with them or interacting with them. right right so you know somebody asked in the chat you know where is the discernment of the holy spirit and the, one of the things about discernment is that you're exercising your senses to discern both good and evil and one of the things that i've learned that we need to sense is when somebody is framing what they are presenting in moralistic language and when they are doing that what the hidden message is is that they are not framing it in epistemic language Mm -hmm. And epistemic is where we're trying to determine what's true and what's not true. So in order to avoid a careful analysis there, which might expose them, they're going to shift over into a, into a moral lane, into a moral role and um, distract you, basically. And, and so even though we say that Christianity produces good morals in people as among the fruit of the spirit, that sort of thing. It also creates an opportunity for these are opportunists to come in and frame things in those way and thereby avoid epistemic arguments for whatever it is they're trying to put across. Now, when I saw you talking earlier, Nick and, and Doug, you can check me on this. I saw you making hand motions out. You know, you're projecting something out and then you have something coming back in. And so the first question that came into my mind is, well, what's coming back in? Is it coming from other people? And then you explicated that it's 
No, it's actually coming from whatever the, they've objectified, whatever is external to them as some kind of reflective object, whether it's the church, whether it's the congregation, whether it's the choir, the Sunday school teachers, the secretary, or any individual, um, that whatever or whoever that is, is just an object that reflects back to them. And that's where it's coming back. And as long as it can reflect back, they're, they're looking for that narcissistic supply. And when they don't get it, like the secretary said toward the end of the email, he doesn't even look at me anymore. It's like he, it's like he realized that's not a mirror. Yeah, it's not a mirror reflecting me back anymore. That's a so great just, observation. You know, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Or he rages at you, you know, because he's not being properly um, idealized. Break the mirror. Uh, yeah, yeah. Narcissists well, uh, need they, that. They, they does yeah. blow up a few times. Go, go, uh, yeah, I want to hear what the rest of you have to say, but he does get angry and blow up a few times in this email as well. Yeah, that's a narciss characteristic of a narcissist. If you injure them, if you got to realize a narcissist is a very small person inside. <laughs> they mm -hmm. look powerful. They huff. They puff. But they're <clears throat> they're just weak uh, man or women. There can be women too, but there's probably mm -hmm. more women. Um, I was interested, Nick, and in, in, I don't want to segue into this, but I'll come back. But it, it's, it's interesting that um, Calvinism is like mythology to me. They create a mythologized mm. God uh, mm. out of their own desire to, to dictate what he would have to do to be sovereign. Uh, and, you know, there's a there's a mythical component to it, uh, which is interesting. I didn't know you're going to come from that angle. I really like that. But uh but I, but I think the the uh, to come back to the the heart of yeah, what, what what he would have to do in order to be sovereign by their estimation. Yeah. Yes, right. Which <laughs> is what a narcissist does. That's why I say that Calvinism creates a narcissistic god, uh, because it's their only way of understanding sovereignty is that God would control absolutely everything, so that you end up with a different God. His di nature is different. His Man's nature is different. The gospel is different. The word of God is different. God, word of God isn't really what it says anymore. It's what the secret pastor knows. And uh, so nar nar or Calvinism is a, is a power over. That's why it's so easy to use it for spiritual abuse, because if mm -hmm. this letter really describes anything, it is classic spiritual abuse. And it goes on more than we would like to know in church right, life. Right, right. Um, I, you know, there's different levels of it too. When, when I was, not to segue too far, but, um, when I went through a divorce, um, it was, uh, traumatic for me. It was, I, I never thought that would be part of my life. Um, I, I was always mm -hmm. significantly involved in churches, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't think God would want me to be, walk into a church again. That's how powerful it was in my list shame in it. And um, uh, I ended up getting involved in a non-denominational church that emphasized that if you've been divorced, you can't be in leadership. So right. you, you sort of, you start to feel it and see it. Um, but I, before that, I decided I was, you know, that God wouldn't want me in a church that I was less than. And it's interesting to me that I thought that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why would I think that? I mean, isn't church supposed to be something different? But I did. Um, and then one of my close pastor friends who actually married Leslie and I um, invited me to preach on Easter Sunday. And it was, you know what, or cut bait. I mean, wow, what do I do? And I said, yes, but what an invitation into the life of Christ again. But my point in that is that, and I was listening to a radio program. They were, some guy was talking, he said he was to these, this prominent person on the radio that, you know, I could never be, I've been divorced. I could never be in leadership again. And nobody stopped him. <laughs> nobody said, you know, really, is that, is that really true? So that, that isn't anything compared to this young woman, or is it younger than me, this young woman in the letter or email that we read, um, who's suffering now. She's mm -hmm. suffering at the hands of, of an abusive group that doesn't mm -hmm. care. And that's the sociopathy piece, the narcissistic piece, that combination of those two things is so destructive. It's so parasitically and so destructive 
because you're right, Kevin, people are, narcissists are always looking for their, their supply of who can idealize them. And you're right mm -hmm. too, Nick. I mean, they're looking for that reflection of, of how great they are. And you better not challenge that because that's the only reality they see. And they just trample on mm -hmm. people. And Calvinism is, I'm not going to argue that every church that preaches Calvinism is spiritually abusive, but I would argue that there's a better chance of it probably because mm -hmm. it is a power over. You, you don't get to believe anything but this. You don't understand the secrets unless you agree with us. It's already spiritually abusive in its nature, in my opinion, all by itself as a systematic. It lends to it, but it's also right there in the pocket um, because it is a secret knowledge. It, it, it is one you've got to believe it. And if you don't, you're wrong and you can't interpret scripture properly and you don't understand God. Um, so, you so, probably so it's like it creates. It. So it's like, it, yeah, it's actually in here a couple of times. It's in, so it's, it, in there, it's the email. You're, it's like, you're like it creates. A, it. It's like it creates affordances. Um for spiritual abuse calvinism does it just open the door, open the door. so do you have like an elevator speech on the dividing line between narcissism and sociopathy sociopathy well i i would in, in the sense that if you're going to create actual we look at narcissism on a spectrum now like zero to ten <laughs> so uh -huh. each of us in this conversation right now or right. anybody listening is going to deal with their own narcissism for the rest of their life we're all selfish we're all trying to get past that right and right. love effectively and and have real humility um so we're all somewhere <laughs> on it but a true narcissist the one we're talking about in this email is a 10 this is a diagnosed narcissist and it often is close cousins with sociopathy because a narcissist really has no empathy and doesn't care so they're they're likely right. they may not prey on people necessarily but once you add a sociopathic element you're usually going to see them hunting for places where they can uh, wow. and sociopaths are interesting one of the one of the ways i know i've got a sociopath in the room i talked to last time about the narcissist but if, if i'm in a, a therapy session with a, nar a sociopath and it's not very often because they generally aren't coming to see me um at the end of probably four or five minutes, I feel like the most brilliant therapist that God ever created, that I am it. Because that's how good they are at making you feel a certain way so that they can have power over you. It's amazing. It's just profoundly so amazing. So they're, they're building you up for the, yeah. for the big trip. You don't trip. even know it. You don't even know it's happening. Hmm. But, but that's why there's, some of them are really charismatic too. I mean, they can they can do this so that's one of my diagnostic <laughs> differentiation <laughs> i'm just feeling like god blessed me and only me perhaps with this kind of presence i've got probably a sociopath in the room as well, well as a narcissist but you combine the two and now you've got domestic violence you've got uh, this kind of spiritual mm. abuse in this email it just plays its way out in such a dramatic way when you when you add the add them together because ne neither sociopaths or narcissists care they, they don't know unless they just want to be idealized. And in their smallness, they want to be, uh, and in my experience, and not to go too far here, but but um, sociopaths and narcissists are the easiest at, uh, in the jujitsu sense of the word because mm. they're so mm. small. And once they I wanna, know, I know it. I want to pick up on this notion yeah, that you've brought out, Doug, about the size of the that that a narcissist you've said it a couple times that a narcissist is a small person and i want to tether that into what kevin said about the narcissistic supply and yeah. what i want to what i want to try and bring out is <clears throat> if if the narcissist uh mythologically speaking is the is a is a self or a person that is projecting themselves and i want to say that deliberately onto objects that can mirror back the self what i said before was that that creates dynamic layers of of what kevin's calling supply back in right and so what i think about is 
that there's a there's a vanity there's a real vanity in um in projecting something out and having it be confused or or like spending too much time trying to manipulate how that input comes back into the self to such a degree where um in the person's in, in that per individual's personal development how can they know in a, in a deeper sense who they are so that they're so what i'm trying to say is that their sense of self will be very 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 small and hindered and stifled um because the supply is one that is isn't meaningful enough to make genuine interaction with other autonomous beings because everything oh, else wow. is just it's yeah. it's merely a an inanimate object that is meant to reflect this tiny yeah. little image which but when you when you when you get all of those those objects like it's my parents and my sister and then my spouse and then my children and then my boss and then my friends and it's you know this this group of people this whole church is now part of that supply there's such a deep deep confusion of the of of the fullness of what what generates a self a sense a of point. self great point nick I so mean, it's a very small person and and really another way to describe that is you, uh, the narcissist is looking for something that that, that really doesn't uh, add anything to because they, they have real no personhood they mm -hmm. have no selfhood and it's it's empty and that's why my one of my arguments is that in, in creating this narcissistic god god has no personhood anymore he has no selfhood he's an empty mm -hmm. dictator who controls everything and that satisfies the narcissist because that's what they want to be. <laughs> they want to control. They, they aren't interested mm. in selfhood because they don't have one. So God ends up being mm. this one-dimensional plastic mythological character, perhaps. Maybe it's Zeus or somebody like that. I don't know. Um, but he has no personhood because he doesn't really love. He mm. discards people. He, he does what the narcissist does. <laughs> And and so we have we end up with an empty God. We end up with an empty uh, Genesis through Revelation scripture. We end up with an empty Jesus. We end up with yep. an empty cross. Empty. We end up with an empty gospel. Yep. Yep. Um, vain, 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 yep. vain. And yep. I'd like to just inject a little philosophical point here that yeah, you know Doug keeps saying that it, the, the narcissist doesn't care. They don't care. They don't care. In phenomenology, um, Mar Heidegger points out that um the the fundamental mode of dasein which is the which is the uh the it's his version of of a person of a of a self of an individual it's it's the meaning making machine it's the thing mm -hmm. that makes meaning its primary mode of what it what it does is it cares mm -hmm. that's what that's what heidegger who is one of the chief phenomenologists says is the fundamental mode of being of what it's like, what it's like to be anything uh, to be a person is to care. Well, so the, so the mantra is the, the, um, the phenomenological mantra is Dasein cares. And so what that, what he's trying to say is Dasein is that which makes meaning. It makes meaningful and genuine connection between, and I have to end it there. Between, yeah. That's so it. between this, it's there's a between this focus. Yeah, which it, which yeah, which ties fair. very that's nicely right. into the biblical notion of faith, which faith is it like like Fowler stages of faith is, mm -hmm. is it's that it's that that between line between a subject and an object which generates some kind of meaning between an agent and an arena and a narcissist is sound it from the way in the language that i'm hearing from doug is somebody who doesn't care and is therefore incapable of making meaningful 
meaning filled connection with the world. And if it can't make a meaningful connection with the world, then how is it reciprocally going to be built up as a, as a full statured person or a self? Right. How is that possible? Yeah. I love that. Wow. Can can I jump on that? Yeah. Or, or I don't want (laughs) to, I don't want to stifle you, Doug. Um, what is popping into my head, and I guess this is half of a statement and half of a question, is that if a person is so small, if a narcissist is so small, um, that tells me that they're li- they're missing an identity. And I just jotted down a note here when I was listening to Nick, because if, if you have no identity, because your identity is so small and you have no self, does that increase the propensity to identify mm. with an ideology? Mm since there is no self to be had or to state it another way or to take on an ideology as part of the identity, like, like filling in that emptiness with something else. And then there's no, there's no meaning capacity there. So something else along with that, the identity formation, this is salient to me because I've, I've had to learn the hard way through reading Fowler's book, studying, the studies of Kohlberg and Erickson and Piaget that identity takes place early on. And then, and then when I hear uh, cluster B personality disorder, like narcissism, it, it also tells me generally that something didn't go right in early childhood. And you have an early child that uh, it's, it's appropriate for a three-year-old or a four-year-old to run around and they are, Superman or Princess Moana, you know, and they're constantly changing their identity. And essentially what happens, what I'm what I'm seeing here from my perspective is that that when the identity doesn't get formed, that identity chasing of the three-year-old princess or the Lone Ranger makes its way into the 20s and 30s, and they're chasing this ideological deity being associated with this paradigm of thought this and they're they're filling themselves up with this as their identity because they don't know who they are they Mm -hmm. they are still full of potential so they're they're princess moana instead of whatever their name is instead of whoever they are and so they're constantly seeking for this thing to be since they they don't have any that's that's what i'm seeing and i I would add yeah yeah i'm sorry I, no, I'm wondering that by you, that. yes, to uh, yeah. kind of, like, what do you think? It's kind of a half question, I guess, <laughs> as much as a statement. I think we have to look at identity development. And <clears throat> one of my, um, one of the things I think you find in the, the theoretical literature that I actually believe is true is I think a lot of narcissists have narcissistic parents who use mm. them, okay? Mm. And they don't know anything other than the mirroring aspect their parents are sucking the life out of them because their parents don't help them differentiate. They don't help them realize who they are and what their uniqueness is and what their characteristics are. Um, so you, you have uh, that, and then you have just in the natural form of, of child development, this, this idea of, of uh, all powerful beings, you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're three years old and you're looking up at your dad and your mom <laughs> You know, your dad knows everything and he's all powerful. Maybe your mom too. And, and so you, you end up with a conceptualization of, uh, which is kind of a narcissistic conceptualization because you want to be that yourself. You, you'd like to be that, right? Um, you like, who wouldn't want to be all powerful, I guess, in, in life? So some of those early childhood developmental features where you are narcissistically used and and where you, 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 you learn that mirroring is kind of essential even to your survival, it's not that unusual to develop your own narcissistic tendencies and perhaps a full-blown narcissistic personality. Hmm. I, I was interested in what you were saying too, Nick, because you were talking about Heidegger and, and uh, might even be Buber, or who is it that's the I, thou, Martin mm-hmm. Buber. Buber, I mean, yeah. Kind of idea. Um, but I liked your word phenomenological because I'm intrigued by the what would be when I think of Calvinist 
sort of letting go of the intellectual piece and really trying to get inside their mind phenomenologically what do they experience yeah. in in god what is it and i think you yeah. know if let's say god all of a sudden allowed you to go back in time and you could watch him before the creation of the world selecting some and dispensing with others how would that feel what would how long would it take before you'd throw up you know i mean the the phenomenal <laughs> calvinism has to result in a phenomenology of yeah. who this God is you're worshiping. So when I follow the, the steps of Jesus, and I'm amazed at the wonder of him and, and all of that, and, and then begin to imagine him as the reflection and uh, radiant glory of this God who's just thumping on everybody, and in, in mm -hmm. a sense, in his decision to save some and not others, it, it, phenomenologically, it's sickening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that makes sense. so just a quick question, quick comment there. I think Calvinists know that. I think they enjoy yeah. the fact that this is emotionally repulsive to the point of being sick, yeah. but they can take it and others can't. So they think more right. haughtily right. of themselves. And then there's almost like a, like a sadist component where they enjoy right. inflicting that, that sickness yeah. onto other people. I want to make Some them feel is. sick. Some pastors more than others, but I would agree with that. If you watch, sometimes watch people preach on Calvinism, it is suck it up, you know, and there's almost an enjoy. I don't know. I hate to go too far with yeah, that. But yeah, I, hard I, pill I, to I swallow kind of approach. Hard pill to swallow. But for yeah. me personally, if I believe God is doing that, you know, he's competing with Satan around whom, how many are going to go to hell and who's <laughs> at the upper edge. I, I can't stand that because that isn't how God portrays himself in the bible sometimes it, he's, right, he's right. It's, it's justice and sometimes there is but but that's that's not that's not the god that draws me in <laughs> it just isn't yeah and, yeah. and that's a, it that isn't because i'm making up a god that i want him to be it's because the plain reading of scripture would suggest right. that god loves us and died for us because of that love yeah. for all of us and i hate yeah. it when somebody uh does, does things to our, our Lord and Savior in the gospel. I mean, it's so amazing. And in Calvinism, it just isn't the good news anymore. Hmm. It's a feat. It is ineffective, only be, only effective because God chose somebody to respond to it. That's sickening to me. Phenomenologically, it hits my heart at, hmm. a, at a really, so not just intellectually, but experientially. So yeah. I'd like I'd like to sort of answer um doug's uh phenomenological observation on calvinists from a less grotesque or sickening view and actually and look <laughs> at it from from an from a, maybe a little bit more of an encourage in an encouraging way so one of the first things that you have to do that a lot of people have to do in order to start quote thinking phenomenologically is to break down your language and understand that your language is how you th a lot of the times the structure of your language is how you think to yourself and your language frames the world for you in very 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 important ways and so when you're learning or mm -hmm. at least attempting to think phenomenologically um like one of the first things heidegger will do when you read being in time is break down your aristotelian categories of um subject and object and or um uh try to get you to stop using language that you don't actually know which is something like saying um yeah well i was watching the news and they're all out to get us and it's like heidegger would say who's they right right yeah. And then, and then the person would would stop and realize that the word that they're using, the pronoun they, they don't really experience that. That's there. There is no they. They is a is is just some abstract word that you're using as a placeholder for something probably more specific. So let's break that apart and try and drive into what you mean. And uh, another example is using the word. Um, just and mm. so like um 
Heidegger wants you to understand your experience, the experience that your body is having uh, a little bit more with more care, with, so with more significance. So if you come home from work one day and your spouse or whoever asks you, how was work? What did you do at work today? Oh, I just, you know, went and towed a big truck or something like that. Heidegger would say to you, what do you mean you 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 just went and towed a big truck? Like, do you understand? Does your your body understands uh, the 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 assumptions, the the conditions that have to be in place, the competence, the the skill set, the set of parameters that have to be afforded to you for you to tow a large truck? Like so, but but you just told, you just did this. So he's trying to get you to pay attention to what you're saying a little bit more. So there's the breakdown of the language. Mm -hmm. And then then what that does when you break down the language and the parameters and framing that quick speech does to your mind, you start to actually experience what your body or um more of what's more of what be, might be salient to some of your other senses. So you it slows you down a little bit. And you're able to observe something in a more phenomenological way, which would be like if we're going to apply it to a Calvinist now, like how does a so the question is, how does a Calvinist think about God or about, you know, theologically um, in a phenomenological sense? Well, you would just have to kind of observe them regardless of their propositions or like regardless of what they state about God and watch them behave at work. And you would watch, you would probably watch a Calvinist like be at work and watch a coworker drop a stack of papers and that Calvinist, you know, try and mute your ears with words and noise and just observe. He would probably just reach down, pick up the piece of paper and say, you know, Hey, they'd probably help them out most likely because and the reason is, is because the, the social value structures of helping someone in need actually supersede their, their Calvinism in, and their Calvinistic propositions or their quote unquote beliefs about election or predestination. The, 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 the moral intuitions that are inside their body as a human mm. being so greatly overpower behaviorally speaking or phenomenologically speaking greatly overpower the the truths that they speak on sunday at church and the creeds that they all recite together in in, in stuff like that so we so, have a whole structure to which we are interactively subjected um unwittingly mm -hmm. that if Calvinism were true, then that person was foreordained to drop those papers and there's probably a reason for it and you better not interfere. But yeah. the but the structure of how we are enculturated overcomes that stated belief is what like, I'm hearing. Yeah, kind of right? like like probably ninety nine point nine percent of right. all of Cal of a Calvinistic it's, person's behavior is is much is influenced much more by um by their non-Calvinism is basically yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> Apple being a very liberal and green company on in their language but being the most ruthless capitalistic company in practice yeah <laughs> I think what goes along with that too is that most people I would say probably everybody acts as if they have free will <laughs> right you know, right you pick up a piece of paper for somebody you right. wanted to do something for them and their phenomenological experience isn't that they had to. Their experience is that they chose to. Exactly. You know, that, exactly. That's a great right. point. Exactly. So, I, so I phenomenology think, is a great way to, to just completely break apart the, the, the propositional structure and the propositional um, like uh, layers of Calvinism, which really yeah. ultimately Calvinism doesn't reach outside of the realm of propositional knowing. It doesn't draw. It doesn't. It doesn't go anywhere else. 
Right. It right. has no That's power. True. It has no power to go anywhere except yeah, there's no, in the there's no procedure. Space. There's no perspective. There's no, no participation. Substance. That's right. No, um, substance. That, yeah, no substance to yeah. it. There's, it's an empty shell, ultimately, at the end of the day. Uh, and to think phenomenologically about how God's thinking of his love for us about, see, God's no longer thinking anymore. There's no longer, if we're just kind of robots and puppets, and I know they hate to hear that, but basically that's the, where the theology takes you. Yeah, it's gaslighting to say that that's not an appropriate analogy. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenologically, you you, you got to get into God's, not that we can, but as best we can, we're trying to figure out maybe how God thinks and how he loves. And um in Calvinistic theology, there there really is no love, in, in my opinion. It's a it's a it's a, it's a diseased love. It's a, uh, so you know. But when you think of how how can God or Jesus even in his framework of ministry, and to the point that he's leading to and Easter Sunday's coming up to his death on the cross and resurrection, um, how can he legitimately have personhood, have value, have real motivational experience within himself if he knows that God the Father chose everybody and doesn't really make any difference. I mean, he can't minister how he ministers. Or if he does, he's a fake. You know, he's hiding something within himself. So it, it becomes empty in how we would understand God. And I think God wants us to understand him. I don't think there's some secret knowledge that he 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 doesn't everybody's gonna miss unless your Calvinistic pastor tells you this is how you have to believe. I don't, I just don't believe that God would do that in scripture. Pretty clear. We have free will and he holds us accountable. I think, you know, for the most part. So um, and I don't mean to yeah. beat that to death, but, but I do think we have to have some appreciation for, um, for realizing that how God has made us, to exist in families, to love, to bring love into the world, is has got to have some similarity to him. Other, otherwise, we have no way to understand love anymore uh, in our phenomenological experience in our daily lives. So, yeah, the notion of the notion of love in Calvinism is absolutely and completely, completely and utterly inverted, and and because it 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 portrays a notion of love which can only when you follow the chain down like like people do all the time it can only bring love down to it ar- 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 it, that it's arbitrary it's it's random and spec in like 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 specifically that is exactly not what love is that's exactly not it's not random it's not arbitrary it's uh i don't even want to say what it is because it's so big but um yeah it's better it's easier to be apathetic about love just like it mm. is about god yeah yeah the arbitrariness right but it, love, has, love has great meaning and and god wants us to know what that is with him uh so yeah i mean it it, it just becomes meaningless um, we have a comment um if if you don't mind me sharing this comment it might be worth commenting on um historically speaking calvinism was a necessary response to totalitarian hegemony of the roman catholic church a theology more brutal and inhumane than the popes was necessary to break from the pope mm. what a statement well, <laughs> yeah, the only con. Yeah, so now huh, it's like coping up with a can of worms. Way to go, Seraphim. Um, <laughs> you know that's what Seraphim does. Yeah, you got, you got yeah. Several good so comments now we're here. now now we're being required. My my <laughs> my Socrates brain is going wild right now because now well, it's like we have to define what we mean by Calvinism because Calvinism, well, yeah. as I understand it, started way before the Catholic Church. You know, and um... well, if you look at the the longevity of the Catholic Church, um, it was Luther and Calvin resurrecting Augustine to yeah. combat. Yeah. You know, over a thousand years later, to to combat what was going on. Um, 
what I wanted to do, I don't want to jump off that too much, but I kind of wanted to get y'all's thoughts on what's what's going on, what mechanism is at play psychologically or philosophically when somebody, a Christian, makes claims that another Christian isn't a believer. So in this part of the email, it says, uh, we saw a whole new side of our pastor. Just my family and the board saw this man blow up. I'm going to share this real quick, too, just so everybody can see what I'm reading here. Um, <clears throat> so my dad brought it before the board, and that's when we saw a whole new side of our pastor. Just my family and the board saw this man blow up. He went so low as to say my dad wasn't a believer. He tore up my dad's papers in front of the board, walked out saying, this is only one man's opinion. Bring it to the congregation and they will keep me. Uh, and a congregation and vote, they will keep me. So it's almost like he couldn't get the board to reflect him back, couldn't get their family to reflect him back. So this congregation will reflect me back. You know, the, that narcissistic reflection, looking for that object. Yeah. So what is it, it? Well, I guess we could comment on that, but also what's going on psychologically, philosophically, when somebody starts saying, oh, you're not a believer? Well, psychologically, it's just bullying. That's what narcissists do. They bully their spouses. They bully anybody that disagrees with them. Those are sometimes what we call narcissistic defenses, arrogance, bullying demeaning people mm -hmm. so you trigger them and 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 that's what you get because it's kind of all they have they don't have right. an elaborate within themselves functioning personhood that addresses mm -hmm. real life and human beings they just have their their bag of tricks which are usually these mm -hmm. kind um so I, I i would just kind of look at it look look at it that way there was something else i was going to say about it but it's not there i can't remember what it was um let me uh let me stick it back up there yeah it, it, it's 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 i, I was listening to um yeah and and so what's the worst you can say about somebody is that they is you you take away their christianhood i mean mm -hmm. what worse can you say that's the worst thing somebody could say to me is that uh now if i earned it because I'm out hiring prostitutes or I'm doing all kinds of crazy things. That's one thing. But well, take, they're, are they Christian prostitutes? Well, they could be. <laughs> so they got ordained it, so I was supposed to do that. But um, might, but might, yeah, be I mean, might, might be nuns. So it's just, it's just one more tactic. That's how small they are. This, this is all they've got. But they end up winning at times if they get into positions of power. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. that's what's sad. It's true. This poor woman who's writing this email doesn't know what to do because she's powerless. <laughs> He's managed to put himself in a position with a leadership board. And unless there are maybe some other leaders that aren't in leadership that could form a uh, gauntlet for her, you know, and, and, yeah, and yeah. approach this guy, maybe. But otherwise, <laughs> her choices are very limited. It's either shut up and 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 pretend you adore him, uh, mm -hmm. be ignored, be shunned. You don't exist, even though you're the mm -hmm. secretary there, or move mm -hmm. on, or move on. Because you got to protect yourself at some point, too, from narcissistic yeah. men or women. You can't just, because it erodes your soul. That's you're true. The church, the body of Christ, and it just is damaging to you. My, my opinion of a cluster B personality person, it's like a tornado or a hurricane. It's just yeah. going to destroy everything in its path, and you can either be in that path or not. Yeah, and they're yeah. they're going to happen. There's no medicine for it. <laughs> no. And it, you know, they express themselves in uh, in relationships. So the closer you get to them, the more likely you're going to be debris for the next uh, storm. Yeah. I was listening to uh, I don't know how it popped up, but I was listening to uh, somebody named Keith Thompson who has his he own should. podcast and he was, he played a clip of Frank Turek and I like Frank. I think he's a good so guy. So if I could pause you just for a second. Yeah. yeah, yeah I get sure. a lot of complaints. There are people who write to me all the time that Keith Thompson is bullying them online. Yeah. yeah. That's what um, he does. So I've he's never actually watched his stuff, 
but I get I get complaints like people who personally know him are asking me for help. Like, what do I do about this guy? And basically, they're, he's bullying them, telling them he's gaslighting them, telling them they're not saved and they probably yeah, can't yeah. be saved and all yeah. kinds of stuff like that. Just yeah. FYI, I didn't know you were going to bring him up, but since you brought him up, that's <laughs> that's what I hear about him on the regular. And Frank gave a really good description of salvation and God's love. Mm -hmm. And and he just ended up accusing him basically of not being a believer, of not having eyes to see. Um, but that's just narcissistic behavior. They're bullies. They're, that's what they are. I mean, because that, that's all they got. <clears throat> and when they know you know that, that's a whole different world. Because um, they, have, they, have, they don't have a whole lot else to, to come mm -hmm. at you. Because there's no, there's no real, and I think you've done a good job too of pointing that out, Nick. There's, there's just a reflection in the water and in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for things to be idealized, but there's nothing underneath it. It's, it's mm -hmm. void and empty and vacuous personalities. And they just do damage and harm because they don't have a relational conception of empathy and connection. Or as Heidegger would describe them, I have to read his stuff because I'm interested in him now. Um, uh, or even Kierkegaard in loving your neighbor and works of love. I mean, there's this sense that there's an interpersonal capacity to engage in love. Uh, and who's your neighbor? It's the stranger at the grocery store. It's not just your neighbor in your in your uh, neighborhood. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's and I I can when I read this email. I can feel with her, you know, mm -hmm. I, when I start to feel with her, I feel, I feel, I just want to go help, help her <laughs> and, right, and walk right. into that church. And um, because I know what she must be experiencing. I have through my career experienced it. Right. Uh, and it, it even feels, you know, it just doesn't feel good to have that come at you. Now, fortunately, I don't let that happen, but she can't not. She's a woman for starters. That doesn't help her situation either. But it didn't really matter if you look at her father who attempted to right the wrong. He couldn't either. And mm -hmm. now she's in a position of vulnerability because he's he's her boss. Right? <clears throat> so now she's... Um, the only thing I, I might think about with her, especially with a corporation, is a toxic work environment. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what they call that now, but you know where you you get into an environment of, of that kind of negativity. But I don't know where that would go. Um, but I want to go Host, help her. Hostile, hostile, hostile work, work environment. environment. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. right, right. That's what that's what she's in, at, at some level anyway. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's right. I feel I feel for her because, you know, when you're in a church and you're under a pastor shepherd. <laughs> like you know kind of concept um that's important it's not important that you idealize your pastor but it's important that he's feeding the flock and and to to have somebody feeding them with toxicity and poison it's well it's really also shameful. it's one thing for a church member to have this happen because you still have your job still have your all that but when you're employed by the church and that's yeah. happening, yeah. Um, somebody's in, in order for that to be resolved, in order for that situation to be resolved, somebody's livelihood is about to drastically change. That's right. And so it's like an animal backed into a corner. That's the power, that's the hmm. power over. Imagine your salvation yeah. in a Calvinistic God is at stake. Now it's bigger yeah. than your job. It's your salvation. And you don't know if you're in or not. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't have much of an, an idea. Um, you may because you believe you've responded to the gospel, but you might be wrong. That's where Catholic theology comes in, but I don't want to go there. But anyway, that to get off track. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, for for a pastor, for somebody who, you know, when you're a pastor, people look up to you. They. Yeah. Yeah. Whether right or wrong, you know, I mean, the Catholics are real bad about this. They, when they see a priest, they basically see a mediator between them and God. That's right. And that's, right. and that's that's very serious. And even though, like, from a Baptist background, we don't believe that per se, people still look at you that way to some degree. And when you abuse that by telling somebody 
that they're not a believer that uh and like that one person they mentioned that person who left the meeting very hurt because they thought they had a heart but if, if, if the pastor like you grow up your whole life thinking the pastor is is god's anointed god's chosen and they have some kind of special access to god's vision yeah. and then when the, I'm, I'm not saying i believe that but people think <laughs> this way yeah, and you yeah. have to be aware that people think this way when you're in leadership just like uh, I was an officer in the army and you had to be very careful what you said, because when you're wearing that rank, it, it affects people in ways that you don't realize. Yeah. And yeah. when you tell somebody they've got a heart problem and if they're truly humble, they're not going to just fight back. I mean, this, this guy is just being antagonistic and trying to use these words to shut these people down. And this guy is really trying to have a right heart before God and like, Oh my goodness, the, the representative of God in my life suggested that I have a heart problem. And now they feel like they've got to go repent of something and they're riddled with guilt and probably anxiety and everything else. It's just like a, it's just a, it's just a mess. It is a mess. It's, it's mm. so just destructive. And now I'm aware that I'm saying the word just, I'm wondering what Heidegger would say about that. <laughs> Interestingly, you know, in, in my practice <laughs> as, a, as a therapist, I always have to remind myself that I don't really know what somebody meant till mm -hmm. I get them to clarify words and clarify yeah. meanings. Yeah. Uh, and we we're, we're so parsimonious in our daily lives, you know, we don't have time for a whole lot of yeah. clarification. Um, but the best thing that could happen in your relationship with friends or your spouse, if you're married or anybody is just to be curious. To realize you don't know exactly what they meant. You don't know what just meant, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, it goes a long ways. And that's where empathy comes in and uh, those sorts of things. But yeah, it's, it's uh, meaning is fascinating to think about in how we tailor our messages. So uh, we have to, in a way, to kind of get by day in and day out. We can't always be asking somebody. But if it's something important, you know, we need to. Uh, and that's one of the problems with the church. They don't teach people to think. Calvinistic pastors, in some ways, I think, um, you know, are telling people not to think, that they've got the secret knowledge. Uh, and and that's you, right. you're kind of instructed not to think underneath the, not said, but that's really the implication. You, you, you can know. exercise <laughs> your cleverness to run defense and propagation scripts in favor of the paradigm yeah but you can't yeah. but you can't actually grow your personhood outside of that at all right right mm. right Does it's interesting when you when you, when you along that line when you see calvinist um debate <clears throat> uh they're one of their i think their main strategies is to avoid phenomenological experience. You can't go there. It's why they won't answer the questions completely. It's why James White never gets to, never answers anything in things mm -hmm. I've seen of him. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, if you start to answer a, in a comprehensive way, you've got to get to uh, a feeling world and, and they don't want to do that. I've never seen mm. a, an interview with a Calvinist go there. <laughs> uh, I've seen them avoid it. Because mm. it's so harmful once you get there into real life. So they're, they're avoiding the feeling world. Is that what you said? Yes. They don't want to go there of what their implications of their theology means. They yeah. just want to keep it, like you said, Nick, prop, or maybe you did, Kevin, propositional. Uh, because then they have, <clears throat> then it's cohesive. Calvinism is a cohesive theology. It's not inconsistent. It's, but. So it's. But, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, it's just funny. It's just funny because you were saying they don't want to go there. And it's in Heidegger's definition of Dasein is being there. That's what it means. That what Dasein means is being there, capital T. Oh, well, I like that. Yeah, it's 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 full presence. It's like full nice. presence there. That's great. So That's awesome. it, it's like it's implicit in our language what we're trying, what's trying to say. That's the logos. It's the thing that's trying to be said it's implicit there in 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 the language it's just trying it's also getting the agent who's speaking to align what they mean with the implicit uh meaning of the word 
So right. it's it, it like we say it so fast that we're it's it's almost like we're we're not cognizant of what we're really saying. And it's yeah. so we can't help ourselves, you know. So if the dot sign is being really there, is it fair to say that a person cannot be fully present, cannot be a full person, cannot really be there if they are operating within the boundaries of an ideology? Yeah, it's like that Jordan Peterson video with um, with that woman when he goes it, it, and you can see it because he's fundamentally a, 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 fun, a phenomenologist. Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. he, he's mm -hmm. very much a phenomenal knowledge. And he tells this lady uh, like it, with like the deepest care and concern that it's like, if you're going to just espouse an ideology to me in front of me, what that means is you're not there. You're not mm -hmm. here. And he's like, that terrifies me because it's such a it's such a profanity and a degradation of mm of the being that God made you to be. I love that, Nick. It, awesome. He, 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 it, 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 like, you could see that it rattles him to his core to see a, an, an agent made in the image of God degenerate to such a degree that they're not the fundamental thing that they are, which is there. They're, they're not there. In front of me. Okay. And so when you're uh, talking with a Calvinist, it, it might as that person really isn't there. Centuries of Calvinism is possessing them essentially like Legion, for we are many, mm -hmm. is possessing that particular individual and speaking through them. And they belong to it and are held captive by it. And nobody will ever know what that person really thinks, and especially them. They mm -hmm. will never know what they think. And you certainly won't know what they think. That's right. Yeah. Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> emphasis on the mirrors. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 What a vibrant conversation we're having. <laughs> this is a, oh, it's very it. interesting. It's very interesting. It seems yeah, to be yeah. unfolding of its own. I'm looking through this email as well to see. Um, and now the present, I'm going to look at this next spot and stop me if you see something that you want to comment on uh, either of you. Now to the present, this pastor has now ramped up his Calvinistic preaching. So just to, for context, uh, Mufasa passed away. Okay. Yep. There is, there is no Simba that we know of yet. And Scar, now that Mufasa is gone, you know, because if you remember, Mufasa was saying uh, this Calvinistic stuff shouldn't be brought into a church. Don't cause division. I'm not a Calvinist. He was standing up to him, which kind of kept Scar at bay. So now Mufasa's dead, passed away. Now to the present, this pastor, so now Scar, without Mufasa there, has now ramped up his Calvinistic preaching. He got his stacked elder board with the men whom he handpicked. <laughs> There's the hyenas coming in. So back here, the board puts him on a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. Then the dad passes away. Now he's got his board, his stacked elder board. Now he's got the hyenas circling him. But the mirrors. These men are all, yeah, the mirrors. There you go. That's right. That's right. These men are all in the same thinking and cannot say no to the elder. We had a meeting and this pastor started to show his anger again. Adam member who took a step towards this man and said, if you don't trust your elders, change your heart or vote them out. Notice that I, what I see here is a false dichotomy. First of all, there's never only two choices. And when you're presented with one, there's usually something they're trying to hide. I also see a contradiction yeah. in theology because I can't change my heart. God has to do it for me. Uh, exactly. That's, that's a really good point. Good point yeah, that's a good really point. good point. Y'all have any comments on this so far? I love the mythological or archetypal overlay on this because I'm curious to see at the end where this leaves the conversation for the email writer's sake, where this leaves basically where it leaves her, um, what, what it, it what it ought to indicate to her. I'm very curious. I, I don't know. 
and I'm I'm very curious to see um how that unfolds as you know when we get to the end uh how that will how the 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 lion king or the the mythological view will what it will indicate to us and to her about what she might what she should do about this you know um cuz a lot of the a lot of the behavioral choices that we do make i think we take um are, are are influenced by the stories that we know the stories that we tell ourselves and the and the the narrative patterns that we we know so that it will indicate to us and influence us to act out those patterns so i'm curious to see what it could what kind of insight it could cultivate for us to maybe re- relate to her or whatever if she's watching what she might infer from from that overlay that we've put over it. Yeah, when you see your situation in a story, sometimes the story gives you clues on what you should or shouldn't do. Thank you for saying that much more succinctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Simba and Luke Skywalker kind of um, parallel each other, you know, from Star Wars and The Lion King. But if you if you go too soon, you get your hand cut off, you see? Mm-hmm. Okay. Let, I'm going to keep that in mind as we go forward. Something like that. There's this statement down here um, about being right and wrong where the elder was absolutely, you know, they talk about who did and who didn't apologize to this person who was hurt. There was absolutely no apology by the elders or pastor. They stated over and over again, they were right. And this other guy was wrong. And that reminds me of the first Corinthians three stuff where it's all about who's right, and who's wrong, rather than how do we love? Mm. You know, when, you, when you're, if you look at the four kinds of knowing, which I should probably paste into here, you know, you got participatory, perspectival, procedural, and propositional. If you're focused on propositional, the only the only thing you can do is either be right or wrong. But when you use right. propositions just as the currency of the other three kinds of knowing and focusing on them, we're, what's the procedure? What's the perspective? What's the participation? And in, and in scripture, Colossians 3.14, the charity is the bond of perfectness. So we should be in, in you covered the best gifts and I show you a better way. And then you get a whole chapter on charity. So we should have charity as the, as the thing that rises to the top of how to be, mm. we should be charitable toward each other, not be so concerned with people being propositionally right or wrong. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's so, so beautiful. It, That's great. So I have in one of my charts, I have with the four kinds of knowing, I have charity and categorically on opposite ends of the spectrum. And you can either have, you can either behave charitably towards somebody and being like, I'm being a husband to my wife or categorically, I have a wife. She's an object that I have. See? Right. Right. And um, wow. when, when you are more propositional, you treat people like, objects with whom you can demonstrate how right you are that's the only way you see them rather than charitably what i'm charitably oh go ahead sorry what i'm seeing with that illustration you made is a is actually a color spectrum and so Mm -hmm. when you ran down the layers of knowing down to the participatory and kind of um, made that analogous to the full participatory like connectedness as mm-hmm. charity, the bond, the thing that connects the bond of perfection. And then at the opposite extreme, something that is completely encapsulated and insulated inside of a proposition space as just black and white, true, false. So mm-hmm. in, prop- in in philosophy, in analytical philosophy or or in formal logic, there's propositional propositional logic which mm-hmm. in when you're doing proposition propositional logic it's just true false 
There is there is nothing else. You cannot say, well, what's the perspective? What's the situation? What's the what are the circumstances? What is what's the environment like? Those are not those aren't allowed inside of formal logic. Formal logic is right. either the sky is blue, true, false. Right, so, right. But, but you can't but this but you can't prove the sky is blue inside of formal logic because there's situational, there's experiential, there's feeling, there's there's all different kinds of things. So what I saw, what you illustrated was like like the fullness of color and um and and dynamic movement inside of uh the chair the charitable end of that and then at the very opposite end it is merely black and white it's merely dichotomous yeah. they're yes, in, yes. in in stultified and immovable because of that so you would have all your colors over here and then you would have over here would be your black and white area Right. So this yeah. is where I have charitable. The closer you get to participatory, <laughs> the more charitable you are. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're over here in proposition space, you're more categorical. You treat people like interchangeable parts in a car rather than being charitable toward them. Like you are being charitable toward them. They mm -hmm. are objects and they're, they're interchangeable. If I don't like this wife, I will swap them out and get another one. If I don't like this board of elders, I will swap them out and get another one. They're interchangeable parts. You don't care about the people. You're not there to develop the people into who they can become. You're there yeah. to build the fancy car kit like you want it. It degenerates into dichotomy. And for the narcissist, it's going to degenerate into the dichotomy, the, the extreme dichotomy of subject, object. Subject, me, world, object. So anything that comes in front of subject is merely object yep there's yep. there is no dynamic layer beyond that dichotomy that's a scary place to be that's useful i think when i think of the charitable piece of it um i think of a lot of the work i do with with people over the years to to get them to be aware, aware of their presence be aware of their own phenomenology ph phenomenological experience so they are creating relationship out of a heart uh, mm -hmm. out of uh, a personhood, out of a self that loves and knows they're loving when they love and intends to love uh, versus just uh, other ends of that spectrum of, of knowing. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes it is you just know somebody because you have an interchange that doesn't have a lot of dynamic to it. <laughs> But when you when you learn to live inside out and you learn that when Christ indwells you and the Holy Spirit, when you learn that so much of what's called upon you to desire God and to love others is from your heart, it's from the inside out, and it is an awareness of yourself as a creator of that kind of connection that that is dispensed with in narcissism, of course. Um, and I right. and, and or either overlooked or dispensed with in Calvinism because there's no room for it. You can't have a phenomenological experience around Calvinism or it breaks down really fast hmm. around what it means mm -hmm. to be a human being. It just it just collapses. That's why I call it a house card sometimes because it's sort of like in the matrix for me. Calvinism became this dissolving um matrix that that couldn't hold up. And, and the primary reason for me, one of them is just, again, experiential. I can't buy into what it's asking me to be in relationship to, mm. to others. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't do it. I can't share the gospel. I can't be excited about sharing the gospel because there's no relevant phenomenological experience that would cause me to experience something good if God's just chosen them. And I do, I'm not really a factor, for example. Wow. But empties itself so quickly <laughs> because mm. we're meant to love we're meant to design we're meant to show up we're meant to have presence yes in in life and the only presence this guy in this email has this pastor is a bullying presence and and adore right, me right. or get out go vote you know because you're both not going to count because i've gotten this collection of people around me and you're not going to win um, i guess so yeah i got the hyenas surrounding me yeah, basically, it's shut up, shut up, or get out. Um, so, 
that well that reminds me of uh you know diatrophies and john and third john who desired to have the preeminence and it's it's all about having the preeminence and then it seems like john recommends well i re i recommend this other guy over here demetrius um the next um the next part of the email says I confronted my pastor at work and told him I didn't agree how he handled this and that it reminded me of the issue with my dad. He said I was wrong. I also told him I am like my dad. I don't agree with Calvinism. He also told me that I'm wrong and that he questioned my faith. And, you know, the same kind of bullying we've been looking at before. Wouldn't you know, the next two Sundays from the pulpit, I got a lecture on election, predestination, and chosen, even though they weren't in the message schedule. He changed it to make me feel uncomfortable. So that's what we call a bully pulpit. The person who has access to the pulpit, they will use it to bully people because it's a one-way thing. They can't say anything back. I'm just gonna bombard you with this. Right. Um, now he won't acknowledge, talk to me at work. Why? Because she's not reflecting back his narcissistic supply that he needs. Yeah. So what next? Do I just <laughs> leave this church? My family is so involved with running the kids programs. So. They're involved with the church. That's also their form of employment. So you're in the Lion King, you're in Nala. The hyenas and Scar have taken over and there is no Simba. What do you do? I love the Lion King analogies because I've never seen it. <laughs> so I'm kind of trying to catch up as we go along here. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch the Lion King. Yeah, it's, I know. It's I, a lot I, like... I think I'm missing out. Yeah. I, I think you have to. Uh, I think that anybody's in the presence of a narcissist has to learn how to protect themselves. And uh, especially if they're in a one down position or two or three or four or five down the, the, the ladder. Uh, and, and again, my only advice to her would be to see if there are other men who were maybe formerly in leadership that would have some say or some ability to challenge this, this pastor, but it might be too late. And, uh, you know, she's got to protect her own heart and soul. She's not in a safe place. Every time she goes into the church to work or go into the service, she's being spiritually abused every right. time. She's got a, that hostile work environment as well as yeah. now a hostile worship environment. Yeah. And you have a pastor that's accusing her of not being a believer. I mean, what worst yeah. thing can you get from your pastor? How is <laughs> that supposed to affect your faith journey? Oh my gosh! When, you know when your primary true. spiritual mentor is uh, questioning your authenticity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, because I of a misalignment with propositions. Yep, that's it. And you can't have a real connection because narcissists don't connect. There's no attachment. There's no bonding in their realm of experience or their design or however you want to look at that. There, they they can't. So the the bridges they form with people aren't really bridges. They're just that's right. That's right. They're just bullying. They're not attached well, in the sense that's of... kind of something I want to talk to you about anyway, Doug, is like you said, the bridges they build with people aren't really bridges. It's not like a really a personal connection. And that's a no. that's a parallel that I see. It seems to me that ideological identification causes people to replicate that feature of cluster B personality disorders, where they are no longer like a, a cluster B person, a narcissist is connecting with another person for the sake of feeding their narcissism and ideologue is connecting with another person for the sake of feeding that, bolstering that ideological identity. You know, I'm a Calvinist, I'm a provisionist, that kind of thing. And they're not really connected with the person. As soon as they stop being a provisionist, well, now your your relationship is kind of downgraded. They might yeah. still talk to you. They might still wave. They might, you know, but we're not close like we were. They're not really connected to that person, regardless yeah. of how or where they change their mind. They're connected to that ideology with the person as a proxy of it, so long as they toe the line. And yeah. I, it's strange to me. It's interesting to me how ideological possession to me mirrors mirrors narcissism narcissistic behavior and that's i don't know if it causes it or if it's just 
they converge in behaviors because you have the splitting, you have the black and white thinking, you know, there's so many things that you have that are the same. Trying they to reflect chicken. yourself back to you. They have the afford the egg. Yeah. They afford each other. You know, it's like it's like um it's not a one or the other. You know, let's do let's, yeah. let's just consider doing away with the um chicken or the egg um um framing of it and say that they might mutually afford each other. Mm. Um and then we could look at yeah, you know, yeah. hypothetically, we could look at how, where do they come from? You know what I'm saying? So it, it, where does ideology come from? And then where does um, um, where does this this narcissism come from? And uh, again, we would have to understand that, you know, narcissism as defined by DSM or how we're using it in modern times is going to is a placeholder is a placeholder for something that you know human beings or societies trying to express about particular types of people right, you know right. um because ancient people will have their rendition of this narcissism and may not have it you know distinctly categorically um prescribable you know, right, right. Uh, under under a a set of these, these parameters, in, in that high of a resolution, so much it, it, exactly. So we have to recognize that um, the notion of narcissism or a notion of a narcissist is kind of a probably a placeholder for something that's trying trying to be expressed about certain people, and then where ideology comes from, you know, is uh, is probably going to run us pretty pretty far back you know yeah so i kind of i want to do another video on this i kind of see ideology as like an egregore like a video uh, not me a video uh, <laughs> i want to do a video on this like an animal like a like a creature like a being mm -hmm. like a like a mothership spaceship who who is harvesting people as the soil in which it grows itself mm -hmm. and when it harvests you in you're only good to it as long as you perpetuate it, help perpetuate it. You become part of the machinery mm. and that's, that's all you can be. So while the logos is trying to, to flow through individuals, when yep. an ideology, when an ideological egregore gets you, you become part of that machine. You are now immune to the logos and the logos. Mm. You're like a kinked up hose that the water can't get through. Mm. Um, that's kind of what I see visually, but um, we're coming up to the end of the time, but I kind of wanted to, I want to start with my suggestion or what I would like to see in situations like this, and then let you guys chime in with whatever recommendations that you have. Um, there are a lot of Calvinistic Calvinists who are stealthily taking over non-Calvinistic churches, and it happens all the time. They just like a narcissist or even a psychopath. I'm not saying they're psychopathic, but that whole idea where they present themselves in a very charming very uh, uh, likable way to draw you in, suck you in, and then they take over the church. And it's it's an epidemic. It's pandemic throughout evangelical Christianity where non-Calvinist churches are being taken over by Calvinists. And I would like to see enough churches do something to stop it. And, and, and you have to see the bigger picture because if you look at a thousand churches maybe a hundred of them have to fight this battle and implode to protect the other 900 so that those stealth infiltrating Calvinistic, you know, aspiring pastors think twice before they try to go into that kind of territory and suck those people into the egregore of Calvinism. So it needs to be, it, I would like to see Calvinists take that off the table as an avenue of approach to spread Calvinism because it doesn't work. Instead of taking over a work that somebody else built up that congregation and that audience, go start your own thing or go to the Presbyterians and, and be a pastor there. Go go do something honest, yeah. like picking peaches or changing tires. You know, that's what I would like to see. And people need to stand up. They need to fight. They need to oppose. That's what I think needs to happen. 
And I, and I do think that that's going to cost some local assemblies. And you say, well, that's causing division and that's causing churches to close. I'm like, look, it's already not really a church. You're pretending at this point. When mm-hmm. you have a narcissist who's an ideologue running the thing, it's not a church anymore. You're not following Christ. You're following a set of propositions. Let's go ahead and blow the thing up so that everybody can see what it really is. Let's see the man behind the curtain and let's start over. I mean, I I think that has to happen a series of times for things to get back on track. And whether or not any particular individual location is the place to do that is another matter. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, My my suggestion is basically going to be almost the same rendition of what Kevin just said, just in a, uh, in a, with different contents. Like, you know, I think what I see here is, and and also my opinion here is by far like the, the least experienced and um, like nuanced inside of like, you know, a Christian, a, a more fundamental Christian, uh, you know, uh, situation, like evangelical environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, um, my suggestion is, you know, in keeping with the, the overlay of kind of like the lion King narrative and potentially the star Wars narrative. Um, I think the, this person needs to do some time and in thinking about you know just what you're ready for and also what your competence your your how much agency you actually possess at this point and make a determination on uh are you simba in the you know you know, not in your kingdom. And are you ready to put up this kind of a fight where you can ultimately kind of oust the, uh, all of the sophistry and all of the, uh, the meaninglessness and the vanity that's going on inside of your father's kingdom. Are you ready and competent, strong enough for that fight? And if the answer is no, then good because what that means is you can either spend the time in getting yourself articulate enough and getting yourself to a level of agency and virtue and power to where you could go and you know remember reassemble remember re hyphen member who you are and oh, yeah, yeah. Re- reclaim reconstitute the kingdom um but there's also the reality of that you know and that that what the lion king doesn't portray is you know simba goes back to the pride lands defeats scar and then in an instant the whole kingdom comes you know all of the desolate land comes back and is fully grown and everything's all beautiful again and that's it takes time that exactly (laughs) that doesn't take you know like the reality is, is that even if you were able to remove this kind of a um, parasite or yeah. um, or cancer, it would take a lot of time, a lot of time to be able to uh, restore um, that that healthy growing uh, right. land. And people have to know that that's what's coming. There was a church yeah. in Oklahoma that had a stealth Calvinist takeover. And they've been represented on this channel. And it took about two years of a lot of heartache for the Calvinistic leadership finally left. And now the church isn't like it was before he came. They're having to start back fresh again and get some new leadership and figure out what they're all about. But yeah, you're right. Um, Doug, any parting comments, yeah. recommendations? <laughs> I don't, I would have done better with Madagascar analogies or, (laughs) 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 uh, I should have assigned uh, some homework. Yeah. I think, I think the, um, I think there's a couple things that I would say. One is that, um, 
that people in these complex situations in these churches need to have somewhere some somebody to turn to. And so I could imagine a, an organization yeah. or a group of men who are willing to be turned to, uh, maybe the three of us, I don't know, but that yeah. would, would have some credibility around maybe a, maybe a small nonprofit even mm -hmm. that's willing to come in and, and, and speak for those who are, are weaker oh, wow. and under pressure. Um, I think that there's some merit in thinking about that something like that because the, these church members become somewhat defenseless and oftentimes they don't know how to exegete scripture they don't know what leadership is supposed to be like maybe they heard the word servant leadership but there's trouble in river city right and mm -hmm. and you've got to Music be bands. able to go to somebody that or a body that um is interested in in making sure that uh, relationship and love are the characteristics of that leadership team. So that would be my. I had another thought, but I can't remember what it was. Um, so God didn't ordain me to remember it. Apparently, <laughs> I can't. <remember. laughs> I think it was important too, but but uh, I think you forgot it of your own free will. Yeah, it could have been my own free <laughs> my own free will. But I think there we're starting to look at the downtrodden a bit right, here right. and um and and i think to have a, a place like this woman in the in the email she doesn't i mean she turned to you um right right and and you can't probably go into this church and do anything yeah there's some limitations um, because 501c3 and then they had to be a member in order to have the right to speak at all anyway there's yeah. there's all kinds of things like that and so yeah. i think uh, along with what you're saying along with having someone to turn to, which would be a great idea, is that people also need to raise their level of capability yeah. and capacity yeah. to deal with these issues, yeah. which is a, you know, especially with the mesh network topology of edification model of Ephesians 4.16, everybody needs to do that anyway. But the problem yeah. with things like Calvinism is that it's not on your radar until it's on your radar. And by time it's on your radar, somebody already has momentum running roughshod over your local congregation. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's hard to overcome that momentum. Yeah. This guy's yeah. already got the momentum. And now they're having to learn about yeah. Calvinism and learn how to interact with people in a confrontational, but healthy way at the same time, which probably isn't going to happen. You're probably going to do both of them poorly, but it has to happen. Yeah, and yeah. and I think I kind of think based on what you said earlier, Doug, that maybe something else you would have said would be that if you're in a toxic environment, you have to protect yourself too. Yeah, you can't yeah. just stick around in a toxic environment. Yeah, 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 and I think if more people knew that and just left <laughs> or threatened, you know, somehow that that person has to stir the pot. And I really respect this person in the email for fighting. Jeez, that's brave. And her dad that fought, you know, yeah. he's, he's raised a fighter in this woman, you know. Well, uh, what I'm hoping happens, you know, the pastor traditionally has a bully pulpit and they have, it's a one-way conversation. Well, we have YouTube and mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't stop links from going around so kind of what i'm hoping is we haven't mentioned any names or or locations or where this church is but if they if that person if this person takes this link and socializes that link they're going to know who it's about and it might yeah. wake people up to what they're yeah. being subjected to in their church and we can fight back against the bully pulpit mm -hmm through YouTube, yeah. which everyone has access to. Good point. That's a, that's a really yeah. great, great point, Kevin. And that's really encouraging too, because that's a great point to make in order to like, like I can just imagine this woman and other people in this church being so like zero focused on this problem and just mm -hmm. having somebody come in and kind of like pull them out of it and look at this from a higher perspective, like the higher mm -hmm. perspective of there is a whole huge, very powerful world out here that um, and, and groups of people that are very 
competent and very equipped mm-hmm. and very capable of dealing mm-hmm. with this what might seem to you as a huge situation because you're so close to it but to take the perspective of people who are back here competent willing and able to embolden and empower you to be able to you know quickly um assemble some resources in order to uh equipped your agency to take virtuous action in in um you know salvaging this uh this environment and this situation it that's a really great point to make um yeah the the internet is a very powerful thing and this is definitely something it, it's connected us you know you could it's connected i'm on the east coast Kevin's in the middle middle of the country and Doug is all the way on the West Coast. And it's like, look at how it's connected. Um we have them surrounded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it makes me, you know, look at what Doug said, like as some kind of resource people could turn to. It almost makes me think of like putting together some kind of resource manual, like a book for what to do if your church is under Calvinist takeover. Anyway, we got any um, final final thoughts, words before we go? This was well, a one lot for of me fun. would just yeah, it's a lot of fun, and we're actually yeah, doing. Dude, it. We're, we're we're addressing it. Yeah. We're raising levels of awareness. I don't see many podcasts that are talking about narcissism a whole lot. So this is great that you were willing, Kevin, <laughs> to introduce. Brave enough to have me have me and, and I really uh, appreciate you coming on. You're you're on. you're raising the class around here, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe or destroying something i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> but, me, but i, I love you i love your adult approach. supervision yeah nick, <laughs> you, nick your stuff was great it really makes me think i got to go read read uh heidegger and and uh i, I love and my work with men i i i or couples i'm always talking about presence how you yeah. show up it's the energy you bring in yeah because you do no matter what bring something in and uh, I like that we have a kind of a presence in the three of us here that has a common objective to, to glorify our Lord, not because he does everything he pleases and, and mixes people. And we want the love of Christ mm-hmm. to be the right. driving uh, engine behind God's nature and how we see him and how we see the gospel. And I think that's powerful to for three of us to gang up on the bad guys. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any, any last word, Nick? Uh, this was just fun. It's, it's been hard for me uh, to uh, participate with uh, beyond the fundamentals in FSI of late, but this was so right, right. necessary. And I'm so happy that uh, I got to have this trilogue with, especially with Doug. Cause uh I feel like we were able to, you know, maybe get somewhere and maybe maybe put something out that will be helpful and meaningful to a number of people. I hope it helps. Yeah, I appreciate both of you. You've uh, really put a, turned this into some quality content, some expert, very great analysis. So I really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much, Doug. Thanks so much, Nick. This has been great having you all. Appreciate your willingness. To, to come on and have these discussions. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Indeed.